In 1939, 907 Jewish refugees aboard the German transatlantic liner St. Louis appeared on Canadian shorelines seeking sanctuary from Nazi Germany. Canada refused to take them in. The ship sailed back to Europe, where 254 of these passengers would later die in concentration camps. Last month, a Syrian toddler named Alan Kurdi fled Syria with his parents and older brother, hoping to seek asylum in Canada, where his aunt lived with her husband. Unable to board a flight or obtain passports, Alan drowned with his brother and mother trying to cross the Aegean Sea. Among other countries, Canada was blamed for a Byzantine asylum process and for erecting barriers to refugees seeking help. Here's the funny thing. In the spaces between these events, Canada had become known as a shining beacon for the protection of civilians. Twenty years ago, Canada sent more peacekeeping troops around the world than any country. Canada presided over significant advances in international law, the Ottawa Treaty, banning anti-personnel landmines, the establishment of the International Criminal Court. Canada was a champion and norm leader in the development of the responsibility to protect doctrine, the notion that the world would no longer stand by and do nothing in the face of atrocities and genocide. Today, at this Davy Forum at University of Toronto, I was asked to come and speak about whether Canada is losing its edge as a good international citizen, as a bulwark of global peace and human rights culture, and if so, why? It's an awkward question for me as an American. Consider a few facts courtesy of the Center for Global Development's Commitment to Development Index. No matter how low Canada scores overall, the U.S. is consistently lower. Canada may give less overall development aid than 13 other wealthy countries, far less than the mean and only one-third as much as the most generous, Sweden and Luxembourg. But it still gives half again as much aid as my country, the United States, which exceeds only countries like Hungary, Poland, and Greece. Peacekeeping. Canada was once the world leader in troop contributions. Canada is now 68 among 193 states, but Americans are number 80 on that list. Monetary contributions to peacekeeping. Canada gives less than 11 peer countries. America gives less than 16 countries, including Canada. Security treaties. Canada was slow to ratify the cluster munitions ban, lagging behind Australia, Norway, the UK, even Mexico, but the US still hasn't ratified the much older landmines treaty and finishes dead last among peer countries on security treaties. Moreover, the US is now profiting from the actual sale of cluster bombs to Saudi Arabia, where they are killing Yemenis civilians. The Canadian government is ambivalent on whether to ban fully autonomous weapons. My government is actively developing these weapons. The Canadian government was refusing to protect and repatriate child soldier Omar Khadr for years to receive a fair trial. Meanwhile, my government, the U.S., was holding him in solitary confinement at Guantanamo Bay, torturing him and threatening him with rape. While the Canadian government has taken in a paltry 3,500 Syrian refugees so far, compared to Germany's 100,000. Uh, the U.S. government has taken in even fewer, only 1,500. So instead of give any real answer to the question, I'll just throw it back to you and ask, what is the appropriate barometer of enlightened international citizenship? Is it for one's good acts to match or exceed the global average? Is it for one's good acts to match or exceed one's capacity? Is it for one's good acts to match or exceed one's national ideals or one's reputation built on a history of good international citizenship in the past? Or is it enough to be a little better than the nearest and easiest comparison, in this case, one of the world's worst performers? If the answer is D, uh, Canada is in luck, because the U.S. is a pretty easy act to follow. If it's A or B, Canada's not doing badly, even after all these years. It's about average. But if it's B or C, then Can Canadians have to think hard, uh, because Canada is not doing as well as it did in the past. And Canada and other northern countries need to grapple with this question now and in the years to come. And for Canadians, that burden may fall especially heavily. The planet's climate is changing. 
For everyone except the northernmost Americans, it has been the hottest year on record. Drought and heat has been one of the key drivers of the conflict that sent Alan Curdy's family to the sea. For Canadians, like Americans, what this means is that more and more of the world will turn its face north in years to come. And unlike Americans, Canadians are sitting on a massive amount of largely uninhabited real estate that may in the next century become temperate. So Canadians especially will have decisions to make. What kind of nation do you want to be as you move ahead? What place in the world will you forge? How will you do it? These are your questions to answer tonight, not mine. But we Americans are going to have to ask ourselves the same questions as we choose our next leader and find our way forward. And I'm honored to be invited to participate in the conversation with you tonight. Thank you.